Perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for being here with us. Um, it's a very dreary, rainy day here in Maryland. So um, I know at least local people are not out working their bees. So we're happy to be able to give you some entertainment for the hour um, while everyone's trapped inside. Um, so yes, Nat is right. I just finished my PhD at the University of Maryland just a couple weeks ago. Um, that was a really unique experience. I also did that whole process virtually um, over the internet. So um, definitely a unique experience. But this is one of my very first talks as a special doctor. Um, so you guys are getting a real treat. I'm sure it's going to be very different from my talks before. Uh, no, just kidding. Nothing really has changed. Um, okay, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the Sentinel Apiary Program, which is one of our programs at the Be Informed Partnership. Um, and so I'm just going to walk through what the program is, sort of a little bit of the history of the program, and then I'm going to talk about some of the uses we've been putting the data to and some other projects that have sort of come out of things we've noticed with Sentinel Apiaries. So um, just for the first couple slides, just in case people are not familiar with BIP, I just wanted to give a really brief introduction. So um, the Be Informed Partnership is a national nonprofit and our headquarters is at our diagnostics lab here in Maryland, but we also collaborate with universities um, all over the country. And we tried to do that so that we could serve directly and in person as many beekeepers as possible and actually be in contact directly with beekeepers and with their bees. So we tried to spread ourselves out as much as we could. And our overarching goals are to reduce colony mortality by sort of figuring out which management practices work and which ones don't. So um, beekeeping can be a little bit of an opinion-based activity. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with um, talking to other beekeepers and hearing their ideas about how to do things and they're probably different from your ideas. So there are all these ideas going around about the very best way to keep bees. And our goal is just to sort of sift through the weeds of some of that information. And you know, we hear these things that people say are working for them and we wanna put them to the test so that we can recommend them to you knowing and having data to back up that they actually work so that you guys don't have to do the trial and error yourselves and waste time and money on something that might not actually work that well for you. Um, and by doing this, we hope that we're um, sort of building a bridge between research and the stakeholder. So the stakeholder is you guys as beekeepers and we're the researchers and we really wanna meet you where you are in the field with your bees and do science that really applies to you and it directly answers the questions that you have. Um, so we really try to serve beekeepers and that's part of the reason we're doing this webinar series. Um, the more that we can share information with you guys, the better. And we have different programs for all shapes and sizes of beekeepers. Um, so we have tech transfer teams, which is our branch that works with commercial beekeepers, uh, the Sentinel Apiary program I'm gonna talk about today, and anyone who has a minimum of four colonies can join that program. We have emergency response kits, which um, are sort of designed for when you have an issue happening in one of your apiaries and you're not quite sure what's going on. We can ship you this kit that has different diagnostics tools to look at Varroa, Nosema, viruses. Um, there's an option to add pesticide analysis onto that so that we can really try to get to the bottom of what the issue might be. Um, the National Loss and Management Survey is one of our most important efforts. This is the annual survey that we send out asking you how many colonies you lost over last summer and the winter and the whole year. And today is the last day of the survey. So if you're on this webinar and you have not taken the survey, please try to go take it today. Um, today is your last chance. It's the final countdown. Participation has been a little bit low this year, we think just with everything going on with COVID. So if you're already at home in front of your computer and you have a few more minutes to spare, please go ahead and take that survey. Um, and then the other thing we do is we sort of execute the USDA National Honeybee Disease Survey. So that's an actual physical survey where we're taking physical samples from colonies um, in each state across the country. Um, and state APRs do a lot of that work for us. Um, looking at Varroa, Nosema, um, viruses, pesticides, and then also checking for Tropole lapse mite to make sure that we don't have it yet in the US. Um, but yes, again, please take the survey. It's super, super important. Um, it's the basis for a lot of funding for honeybee research, uh, basically citing that you guys are losing all these colonies every year. So um, please go ahead and take that if you have time. 
Okay, um, so now I'm going to start talking about the Sentinel Apiary Program. Um, so this is a colony health monitoring program and originally it was targeted more towards the hobbyist beekeeper, but um, all beekeepers are welcome to participate and we think that all beekeepers can have something to gain from this program. And you can participate at a four colony level or an eight colony level. And the program runs for a period of six months. So it's starting um, in May. We're actually, we've been shipping kits the past couple weeks. Uh, we are actually building the kits at home in our apartment and driving them to be dropped off at FedEx location. So we're still up and running. Um, it looks a little bit differently than it does normally for us, but everything we're planning on running as usual. We have diagnostics labs set up at home with broa shakers and microscopes to count nosema. So we're planning on being able to serve you just as we have always done. Um, and then there is a cost to participate in the program. So for four colonies, it's $275. And for eight colonies, it's $499. And for that cost, you get um, a sampling kit mailed to your house, which has all the materials you need to sample these four or eight colonies for a period of six months. So that includes sample bottles to collect adult bees for Varroa and Nosema. Um, we send you data sheets and protocols that short, sort of teach you how to perform a colony health inspection really thoroughly and record that information on a data sheet. Um, you are going to go ahead and do those health inspections and record queen status, brood pattern, and frames of bees. And then you're also going to record any mortality information if you have any colonies die over that six month period. Um, so basically, you as the beekeeper is gonna take those samples. So you get mailed that kit that contains um, a whole bunch of these little sample bottles, this little quarter cup scoop, a funnel, um, all to help you sort of take the samples from your colonies. And here's a data sheet that's included as well. Um, so basically what this looks like is you take that month's kit out to your colonies um, whenever you choose to do that sample once a month. You're gonna go through each colony. You're gonna find a frame of brood that has some capped, some uncapped brood. We're trying to get a lot of nurse bees um, in the sample since they tend to have the most mites on them. And you're gonna shake that frame into a tub or you can sample bees directly from that frame. Um, and if you are a participant, we're actually coming out with a new video next week to sort of demonstrate how we take these samples to make it a little bit easier, hopefully for you to take these samples. So look out for that. Um, and then from this, tub or from the frame, you're going to collect about 300 adult bees. And then you're going to mail those bottles along with your data sheet to our lab at the University of Maryland. And we're going to go ahead and process those samples for you. Um, so here's an example of what an actual data sheet looks like. Um, you can see sometimes they're covered in sweat, they get nectar dripped on them. Usually they're like sticky with propolis. Um, one time we had one with a hole burn through it because somebody sat their smoker on it. So it's really fun to see what comes into the lab. Um, it is truly a snapshot of what was going on when you were taking those samples. Um, if it's a stressful day and the bees are mean, sometimes they get an extra snarky note or the handwriting's a little more frantic. So we really do feel like we're with you when you're taking those samples. It's pretty fun for us. Um, so you're gonna ship those samples and these data sheets to our lab at Maryland. And then, like I said, we are gonna process those samples for you. Um, so this is in our actual diagnostics lab. Like I said, this looks a little bit different for us right now, but we have this Broa shaker um, and our lab manager actually took this home. So this is up and running in her garage, um, but it shakes 12 Broa samples at a time. Uh, we count the mites and then 100 of those bees go on to Nosema processing where we count Nosema spores. Okay, after we've done that sample processing, we um, put all of this information into a report for you. So this is a real report that was from 2018. Um, and you can see this beekeeper sampled all six months, which is great. And you can see their colony numbers one through eight here. So basically this is really cool because it is now this really thorough record of everything that's happened to those colonies over the whole six month period. So you can see that um, as an apiary as a whole, these are just the mite loads, mites per 100 bees. You can see that we were pretty low in May and June. Um, this one kind of spiked up here in July. The whole apiary kind of then spiked up in August. 
Um, and then they had a successful treatment going into September and brought those loads back down. So um, it's this really cool record of what went on in your colonies for a whole year. Um, in addition to the results from Varroa and Nosema, you also get these cool graphs. So this is the uh, apiary average mite load and you can kind of see it over the season. Um, this light gray bars back here is the national average from the US Honeybee Disease Survey. So you can kind of compare your apiary to the national average. So you can see this beekeeper was doing better than the national average and then was a little bit higher, but then much lower again by the fall. So that's great. Um, and then this blue line again here is what we consider the treatment threshold for Varroa, which is three mites per 100 bees. Um, there has been updates to that threshold. Now people recommend that in the spring um, you want to get that down pretty much as low as you can to one, maybe two mites per hundred bees. But in the fall, three mites per hundred bees is still a pretty good threshold. But anyway, we recommend that when you exceed that threshold, you go ahead and do a treatment. So you can see this beekeeper exceeded that threshold, performed a treatment, and then that mite load went back down by September. Um, we also include a graph of each colony individually, so you can see if you have any standouts. Um, so you can see here this yellow line. This is colony number seven, and that colony spiked up quite a bit higher than the rest in August. Um, so you can really clearly see that when you look at it in this format, and maybe note that that colony might have had something else going on or might have a little bit more issues in the future and might just need a little bit more attention. And then we also include everything that you write on that data sheet. So if we can read it, which is not always the case with beekeeper handwriting, but we try our best. If we can read it, it ends up on this data sheet. So you have um, your queen status, brood pattern, frames of bees, any notes that you write. We have people filling in the margins, writing on every open square inch of that data sheet, and we try to get it all on here. Um, and then it also has your mite load and your nosema load on there too. So again, this really cool thorough record of everything that happened to your colonies over the whole year. Um, okay, and then the other cool thing about Sentinel apiaries is that they can kind of act as benchmarks for regional colony health. So we have this really cool online data explorer where um, there's a whole map of the US and you can actually go in and click on your state. And if there's a Sentinel apiary in your county, you can click on your county. And you can compare your mite loads to the Sentinel APRI mite loads. Um, so, you know, we hope that even if beekeepers aren't participating in the program, they can still learn from it by comparing their apiary to the Sentinel apiary nearest them on this map. And then um, also on that same data explorer, we have hive scale data. Um, and when we started the Sentinel apiary program, hive scales were required. Um, and then we took away that requirement because um, we felt it was sort of prohibiting some people from being able to join because hive scales can be a little bit expensive. Um, but there are quite a few hive scales paired with Sentinel apiaries. Uh, so it's very cool to be able to compare that data. And if you were on Natalie's webinar last week, you saw that she actually went into the online database on the webinar and I was inspired by that. So we can actually go and look at the Explorer um, if I can change how I'm sharing the screen. Let's see here. Okay, can you see that? I think so. Okay, so this is our data explorer and you can see it's at bip2.beinform.org. Um, and you can also actually type in research.beinformed.org and it'll get you here as well. And there's all sorts of really cool data on here. So we've tried to make as much of our data public and shareable with beekeepers as possible. So if we come down here to hive monitors, this is our hive scale map. And you can click on it. And um, our IT team has put a lot of work into this Explorer, so it's pretty neat. Um, any state that's in blue has gained weight recently, and any state that's in red has lost weight recently. Um, so we can go and click, um, let's look at Texas. You can actually click on their scale and you can see um, the temperature it's been lately. This blue line is the temperature. Oh, it's been warm, 85 degrees, very nice. 
Um, and you can see the black line is the colony weight. So it looks like they're just starting to gain a little bit of weight right now. Um, maybe just starting to get a little bit of a honey flow. So it's really cool. You can click around on all the different states um, and sort of see what's going on. That one's been holding really steady. Um, and then we can look at Sentinel apiaries. Um, so here we have the whole country and you can go by year as well. So it goes all the way back to 2014. We have the most data sort of starting in 2016 and going forward from there. Um, so we can look at last year and I'm in Maryland, so I can click on Maryland. I'm in Montgomery County. Okay, and then I clicked on Montgomery County and you can see it's gonna compare all four of these Sentinel apiaries. So you can click that. And then it'll actually give you a graph of the mite loads month to month um, in each of those apiaries. So it's really cool. There's a lot of information on here. You can look at Nosema also. Um, and again, this straight line is that national average that you can compare to. And then you can also average by the whole county. So you can look at Montgomery County, the county I live in, compared to the national average. So it's kind of fun to go on there and play around with. And also get an idea of when the mite loads peak in your area, how early you might need to be worried, um, and how high they might actually get. So um, let's see, I can go back to PowerPoint. Great. Okay. So yeah, I encourage everyone after you take the loss and management survey to go on there and sort of look around and have fun with that. Okay, so we started the program in 2015 and you can see that we mostly had participants in the state of Maryland. Um, the program was actually crowdfunded in the state of Maryland so we could have a Sentinel Apiary in every county. And then we just had sort of a few in other states um, and some at BIP collaborating universities. Um, then we grew a little bit in 2016, expanded to more states, grew kind of a lot in 2017, um, and spread out a little bit more in 2018. And then last year in 2019, we grew a lot again, and we had 106 Sentinel apiaries. Um, I think we've been up to about 30 states by now. So the program's really expanded a lot. Um, so far for 2020, I think we have about 85 people signed up. You're still welcome to sign up um, if you're on this webinar and you want to. We're still um, sending out kits and building kits and things like that. So if you don't see a little red dot in your state, please feel free to be the first and join us. Um, we, we expected things to slow down a little bit this year due to COVID. So we're really happy with the large number we already have. Okay, um, so this is all really great. We hope that beekeepers are learning a lot from this program. We have a lot of repeat participants who participate year after year. So, um, you know, we know that they like it at least. Um, and we, we have heard from beekeepers that this really does help them keep a very thorough notebook um, and really thorough records and sort of better learn to be able to predict how their colonies are gonna behave over the season which is really valuable information. So um, we're very happy to be helping beekeepers in that way. But um, the other really exciting thing about this program as us to scientists is the amount of data that this program provides. So um, this is each year and you can see the number of beekeepers we've had participate each year, the number of colonies those beekeepers sampled and the number of samples processed. Um, and you can see that over the five years of the program, we've processed over 10,000 samples for Varroa and Nosema. So this represents a huge amount of data that we can use to answer some questions that beekeepers tend to ask us, um, which is really great and really valuable. No other BIP program collects data on this level where it's the same colony sampled over an entire season. So it is incredibly valuable information to look at how colony health and management sort of changes over a very long term. Um, so we can look at some of those questions. And as you might imagine, most of the questions we get are about Varroa and Varroa treatments. Um, so people wanna know a lot about Varroa treatments. They wanna know how well they work. Sometimes people apply a treatment and they feel like it didn't work that well. Why did that happen? And they wanna always know what method should I use. Um, they wanna know what we use. They wanna know what they should use. So we can sort of use this information from the Sentinel program to look at how well these treatments work and we can compare between different methods to see if some tend to be working better than others. 
So um, for part of my dissertation, I started to do this. And basically what we can do is we can look at the mite load before and after a treatment is applied, right? And the expectation is that after you apply a treatment, your mite load should decrease, right? You expect to apply a treatment and have your mite load go down. That's what we all hope and wish for. Um, and that would look like this. So um, this is pretty similar to the beekeeper's report I showed at the beginning. But basically, um, we have a mite load starting pretty low in May, sort of creeping up through July. We're exceeding that threshold of three mites per 100 bees in August. Oops. Um, a treatment is applied, and then the mite load should go down by the next month and hopefully go down below that treatment threshold and be nice and low while your colonies are trying to prepare for the overwintering period. Right? So ideally, again, we apply this treatment, the mite load goes down. Well, when we started looking at Sentinel apiary data, we found that mite loads actually typically increase after a treatment is applied. So um, this is just each sampling month. So if we're looking at a treatment that was applied between the May and June sample, that's what this bar is. A treatment that was applied between the June and July sample is here. And an orange um, is the proportion of the time where the mite load actually increased after that treatment was applied. And in green um, is the proportion of the time where the mite load decreased, which is what we expect, right? So only about 30% of treatments are resulting in a decrease in mite load. Um, so only about a third of the time are we actually getting that expected result of the mite load going down. So when we saw this, we were like, uh-oh, that's not good. Um, why aren't these treatments doing what we want them to do? Um, why aren't we seeing the expected results? Um, and we hear a lot of reports from beekeepers that they apply a treatment, especially a longer term treatment, like, um, you know, sometimes these treatments are three to six weeks and they sample before and after and the mite load either stayed the same or didn't go down and they're frustrated. So um, we were surprised to see how often that's actually happening and we wanted to sort of look at what's really going on and try to figure out why that might be happening. Um, so if you look at the actual change in mite load between treatments, between months. So again, we have between May and June, between June and July. And in orange here, we have apiaries where no treatment was applied. And in green, we have apiaries where a treatment was applied. So the slope of these lines here represents the change in mite load between those samples. So the slopes are positive, right? The lines are slanting upwards. And you can see here's the post-treatment varroa load. So you can see that the mite loads are actually increasing between months. But what's really important to note here is that the green lines um, in the apiaries that were recently treated are flatter than the orange lines in untreated apiaries, especially here between September and October. So again, this is sort of that pre-winter, late fall period. And you can see that in untreated apiaries, the mite load is increasing a ton, very rapidly. Um, and by applying a treatment, the mite load still goes up a little bit, but much less than it would if you didn't treat at all. So it's really important to note that treating is still very important and it's still making a big difference. Even if it's not actually decreasing your mite load, it is slowing the increase. So your mite load is increasing at a slower rate. And that concept might sound familiar to you because it's what we're all doing right now by staying at home. We are flattening the curve of cases of COVID-19. We are trying to slow the increase. We know it's going to increase, but we're trying to slow it as much as possible. So that's basically what you're doing when you're applying a Varroa treatment. You are slowing the increase in that mite load. And that's very important to do because even if that mite load creeps up a little bit, if you can prevent it from skyrocketing like this, you can still get your colonies to a place before winter where they're gonna be able to overwinter successfully and they're gonna be healthy enough to survive that winter period. So especially in this fall period, it seems very important and that treating does make a big difference even if you don't see a decrease. So um, we think this means that your expectation when you treat just might have to be tweaked a little bit. You might not see a huge reduction in numbers, but it doesn't mean that that treatment didn't work um, or that the chemical is ineffective. We really don't think the chemicals are ineffective. We think the treatments work and they kill a lot of mites. We think that um, 
the mite load still increases a little bit just because the mites reproduce so fast and they're spreading around between colonies so quickly um, that it's just, even with a successful treatment and a chemical that kills a lot of mites, it's hard to actually keep that mite load low and actually see a big decrease. So treating is still important. It still does work. Um, you just might have to adjust your expectation just a little bit. You might not see as big of a decrease as you may have expected. Okay, um, and prevention is key here. So if you imagine that you're slowing the increase, um, here we have the, um, this is a graph by the Honeybee Health Coalition that compares the population in your colonies to the mite population. So here we have sort of the winter period and we're kind of here in this early spring period where your colonies are starting to increase, the nectar flows are starting, um, the queens are starting to lay, and you might be having some swarms already if you're far south enough. And as the population of your bees increases and the number of brood cells increases and the more that queen starts to lay, here this orange line, the mite population, starts to creep up as well. Um, and it's lagging behind the bee population a little bit. You can see it's a little bit slower, but by that fall period where your bee population starts to decrease, there's still a huge mite population. And this is where we get into trouble, right? Where the mite population is exceeding that bee population, that's where we have crashing colonies, that's where we have really, really bad viral infections, and that's where we're not gonna make it through the winter. So the key here is to try to get ahead of this so that you don't get to this situation where you have a really high mite population and a small bee population, because that's critical, kind of too late to save at that point. So what you really want to do is be proactive here. And really the earlier you can flatten this curve, the earlier you can slow this increase, the better. And it might help you delay when you have to apply another treatment. It might help you have to apply fewer treatments. But now, right before you put honey supers on, is a very important grow a control time because if you don't get to it now, by the time you take those supers off, you might have an issue. So we really try to recommend, um, go ahead and monitor and see what your mite loads are. But if you have more than two mites per 100 bees, I would say, just go ahead and try to get a spring treatment on there. Um, you will thank yourself later, it'll make a big difference down the line because you're gonna slow that increase in mite load quite a bit. Okay, so then the other question we get quite often is what treatment should I use? Um, so I tried to do this again where we're comparing the change in mite load, so the pre-treatment mite load to the post-treatment mite load um, between different treatments. And again, here in orange, we have apiaries that were not treated. And in green, we have apiaries that were treated with these different products. So we have Amitraz, we have Combination, which can be any two products combined. Some people do, a formic acid followed by an amitraz, or they do a non-chemical method followed by a chemical method that's included in combination. We have formic acid, we have thymol, and we have oxalic acid. And again, you can see that in most cases, the treated apiaries are still increasing, but um, they are increasing significantly slower than in untreated apiaries. And you can see over here with amitraz, the line is actually basically flat, even a little bit slanting downwards. So, that one seems to be pretty effective, um, but that's also one of those treatments that's longer. Apivar is a six week treatment. Um, so it kind of gives a lot of time for, if you apply the treatment and it's effective at first, if you don't sample for six or eight weeks afterwards, you could already see an increase in mites after that treatment was initially effective. So we do hear a lot of beekeepers um, treating with Amitraz and then coming to us and saying, well, my mite loads went up, um, but again, keep in mind that they probably went up a lot slower than if you had not treated at all. Um, so these chemicals, these active ingredients seem to be better than not treating at all. Um, and then we also looked at these other ones, Kumaphos, hop oil, fluvalinate, and non-chemical methods only. And those, um, the change in mite load was not different from not treating at all um, in these situations. That doesn't mean it's that they're never effective, it just means that um, when they were used in these sentinel apiaries, it didn't seem like it was much better than not treating. And some of these have documented resistance like um, fluvalinate and kumaphos have been around a long time. So um, it's thought that they're more effective again, but 
I guess that could be um, playing a part here. Okay, so then when you're talking about what treatment should you use, um, this suggests that these things may be slightly more effective than others, um, but it really depends on your personal preferences and what's going on in your apiary at the time. So these treatments have very strict temperature ranges that they can be applied in in a lot of cases. Um, some of them can't be used when you have supers on. Some of them are only effective or are much more effective when there's no capped brood. So it really depends on the situation in your colonies at the time that you need to apply that treatment. So the Honeybee Health Coalition has a lot of really good tools to sort of help you decide what treatment is going to work in your situation. Um, this is an actual decision tool where you can click on here and enter sort of your, um, the situation in your colonies and your season and your region and things like that, and they'll help you decide. And then they also have this great PDF with tons of information about different Varroa treatments. Um, this has those updated treatment thresholds that are lower in the spring um, and a little bit higher in the fall. So um, all those resources, resources are in there for you as well. So we really recommend taking a look at that if you're not sure um, what treatment to use. Okay, um, so the other thing that we really noticed with all of this sentinel data is that mite loads are really high in the fall. And we see this in sentinel apiaries, but also in a lot of our other programs where um, even if beekeepers are treating, so again, here we have treated apiaries and in orange we have untreated apiaries. Um, and here this red line is that threshold of three mites per 100 bees. Even in treated apiaries, we're exceeding that threshold in the fall. Um, so again, we're kind of scratching our heads about this, is like, why are these mites reproducing so quickly, or is it something else? Um, why are these mite loads still increasing after treatment, and especially in the fall, what's going on here? And one of um, the most popular ideas about why this might be happening so much, especially now, is this idea of horizontal transmission. So horizontal transmission is when mites move between colonies and between apiaries. So um, this is sort of that mite bomb idea where if you have a neighbor who has really high mites for some reason, it's possible that that neighbor's bees are spreading those mites to your colonies. So even if you did treat, um, right, even if you're a recently treated apiary, your mite load could go up because your colonies are contracting mites from your neighbors. Um, so there are sort of two hypotheses as to how this actually happens, um, and one of them is through robbing. So um, the idea here is that if your colonies, your recently treated colonies, are big and they're healthy and they're strong, um, they might visit these colonies that have high mites. Um, and conceivably, these high mite colonies are gonna have, um, sort of be weaker in general. They might have lower population sizes. They might be less able to defend themselves against intruding bees from your really healthy um, colonies. So basically, your colonies might come over here, rob these colonies out. While they're in here looking for resources and interacting with these high mite bees, they might pick up mites and then return home with those mites attached to them. So, um, you know, this would be if you went to the grocery store and touched an infected person and then came home and you were infected. Um, so this is sort of the robbing idea of how this happens. And then the other idea I mentioned before is this mite bomb idea where the high mite colony actually collapses, it totally crashes. And the bees from that colony don't just stay there. They're not just trapped in there. They actually um, leave their colony and go out into the landscape and end up in your colonies. Um, they get lost, can't make it home, or they start to rob and they don't make it back or whatever. But basically they crash out and explode into the landscape and they bring mites with them um, and they vector them to these receiver colonies, which would be your colonies. So um, we sort of wanted to investigate uh, how often this was happening, um, if, if we thought this was a contributor to these high fall mite loads, and we wanted to see um, if we could sort of tell whether we thought it was more to do with robbing or more to do with um, this mite bomb idea. So to do this, we set up this huge experiment at the Clarksville um, Agricultural Research Station in Maryland. 
And basically what we did is we had a central apiary, which is a donor apiary. And then around that central donor apiary, we placed eight receiver apiaries, um, which are these little white circles. And you can see what I tried to do is have sort of an inner radius. These are about half a mile from that center and then have an outer further away radius. And those are about one mile from the center. And I also tried to roughly go north, south, east, and west of the center, um, but the farm is not a perfect square, so it's not perfect. But um, we kind of wanted to just space these out in the landscape as much as possible. And at each of these apiaries, there are four colonies. So um, there are 36 colonies total in this experiment. And in the donor apiary, we have two high mite colonies and two low mite colonies. So we had two colonies moved there that had really high mite loads, like um, I think one of them had five mites per 100 bees, but the other one had like 15 mites per 100 bees. So a lot of mite pressure. And then um, we had two low mite colonies in the same yard that um, had low mites, like one mite per 100 bees. Um, and that was to sort of act as a control and compare the behavior of these healthier low mite colonies to the high mite colonies. Um, and then what we do is we paint as many of those bees in the donor apiary as physically possible. So this is, um, as you might imagine, quite a process. Um, basically what we were doing is shaking uh, each frame of bees into a plastic tub with a lid on it. And then we would scoop out about 500 bees at a time. We would anesthetize them with carbon dioxide. So they pass out. And then we would spread them out. This is just an upturned sticky board, actually. Um, spread them out onto a sticky board or just another flat surface. And then sort of as they come to, as they wake up, they're very slow moving and they kind of hold still long enough for you to paint a whole bunch of them. Um, and these are just like normal queen marking pens. We use Sharpie paint pens. Um, and so we're just marking as many bees as possible. And um, we did this for the two low mite colonies and the two high mite colonies. And the low mite colonies were painted blue and the high mite colonies were painted red. So now we can identify bees coming from this donor apiary, whether they came from a high mite colony or a low mite colony. Um, and we can actually tell individual bees apart. Um, we were not super accurate in our painting. Um, so each mark looks a little bit different, which is cool because then we can actually tell different individuals apart. So this little bee, um, she's painted blue, so she came from a low mite colony. And you can see her mark is a pretty regular oval. Uh, this little girl got more of a cute little heart-shaped mark. Um, this one was really unfortunate and got one on the thorax and the head, um, but she was still able to fly. You can she's, see she's flying here, so that's good. Um, and then of course we have red, uh, red ones as well from those high mite colonies. So we can tell different individuals apart. And basically we can see where these bees are going um, and which colony they came from. And uh, to see where they're going, each receiver apiary was mounted with cameras. So all 32 colonies in those receiver apiaries had cameras placed on the entrances. So this is what a receiver apiary would look like. We have um, these little cameras and you can see we have a reduced entrance there with a little piece of cardboard as um, sort of a neutral backdrop. And the camera lens is just right here, just pointing right down at the colony entrance. Um, and the cameras are just made of Raspberry Pi motherboards, which is a really cheap computer. They're like um, $30. You can program them to do a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so I watched a lot of YouTube videos and basically I figured out how to teach them to recognize our paint colors. So you can attach a little camera to them and you can tell the camera that whenever it sees the color red to take a picture and whenever it sees the color blue to take a picture. So by doing this, we can identify those bees, those painted bees from that donor apiary as they enter these receiver colonies, right? So any painted bee who enters a receiver colony will have its photo taken and we can see the extent to which those high mite bees are entering these apiaries or the extent to which those low mite bees are entering the apiaries. And we can sort of track their movement. Okay, and then we also wanted to ask if robbing screens can prevent these bees from other colonies from getting in. 
So it sort of stands to reason that um, if this is an issue of um, the mite bomb situation where your neighbor's high mite colonies crash and those bees um, end up in your yard and your colonies, if you put a robbing screen on your colonies, it should prevent um, your neighbor's bees from figuring out how to get into your colonies because the robbing screen um, kind of makes these colonies easier to defend um, and it also confuses bees that are not originating from this colony. So the idea is that um, outsider bees should have a more difficult time getting in. Um, so we thought that robbing screens might prevent um, those high mite bees from being able to find their way into these colonies and that it might prevent that mite load from increasing. So if it's an issue of bees from those high mite colonies bringing mites with them, if the high mite bees are not able to get in, they're not able to bring their mites with them, then the mite load in these screened colonies should stay lower throughout the experiment. Um, so each receiver apiary, two of the colonies received robbing screens and two of them were unscreened. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna jump right into results for this. So um, I'm gonna show you the number of painted bees we found in each apiary, but through those cameras. So um, you can see most of the bees were found closer to the donor apiary. So again, we have this closer radius here and this further radius over here, these white circles, we did not find any painted bees there. Um, and again, this closer radius is about half a mile from the center. Um, we only found one painted bee at this far away radius down here, um, and it was a blue bee, so from a low mite colony. Um, here we found the most number of painted bees, the second most, the third most, and the fourth most, so the size of the circles is the number of painted bees we found. And you can see that most of the painted bees we found were actually blue bees from the low mite colonies. Um, we found uh, very few bees, only about 20% of the visitations were from high mite bees, and 80% of the visitations were from low mite bees. Um, so already this is sort of uh, debunking that idea of the mite bomb hypothesis, where a huge number of these high mite bees are ending up in these colonies. Um, because we saw much higher numbers of these low mite bees ending up uh, out there. Okay, so we also tracked the mite loads in the receiver colonies throughout this experiment. Um, and the mite loads in all the receiver colonies did increase over the duration of the experiment, but the increase in mite load was not higher in colonies that were visited by high mite bees. So this red bar is the change in mite load, and again, this is just the percent change in mite load. So um, a 500% change in mite load would be a five-fold increase in mite load. So if you started with one mite per 100 bees, you would end with five mites per 100 bees. Um, that would be a 500% increase. I hope I did that math right. It's Now that I'm a doctor, I can't do mental math. So bear with me. Um, so you can see that the percent change in mite load. So here, is the colonies that were visited by those red painted bees from high mite colonies. And you can see that their increase in mite load is actually lower than um, in colonies who were not visited by high mite bees. So this increase in mite load does not seem to be associated with visitation from these red painted bees. So again, kind of further debunking that mite bomb hypothesis that these high mite bees are very frequently ending up in neighboring apiaries and that they are um, bringing a lot of mites with them. We just did not see that. Okay, when you look at the increase in mite load um, in colonies that were visited by any painted bee, that's this purple bar. Um, and in gray here are colonies that were not visited by any painted bee. So in gray here are colonies that were never visited, they did not have any painted bees enter them. Um, and in purple here are colonies that were visited by either a red bee or a blue bee that had any painted visitor throughout the experiment. And you can see that they had a lot higher increase in mite load than these unvisited colonies. So it does seem like there's something about a colony's ability to receive visitation and its likelihood to receive visitors um, that is associated with this increase in mite load. 
Okay, and then when we go back to the robbing screen idea, um, you can see that the increase in mite load was lower in screened colonies. So there is something about that screening, that preventing of visitation, again, from foreign bees, that is helping reduce that mite load. So it seems like the amount of visitation a colony receives, the more visitors it receives, the higher its mite load is going to increase. Whether it's from a high mite colony or a low mite colony, it seems like any visitation is not great for your colony's mite loads. Okay, so this is sort of a weird collection of results and it wasn't really what we were expecting to find and it doesn't really support either of those hypotheses that we started with. Um, so varroa loads did not increase faster by high mite visitation, right? So this idea of the mite bomb where these bees are leaving from these high mite colonies and entering your colonies with mites doesn't seem to fit. Um, the robbing screens slow the increase in mite load, right? So robbing screens seem to help. Um, so again, if we go back to that idea of the robbing hypothesis, if your own colonies were robbing out these high mite colonies and bringing back mites, they would not be deterred by those robbing screens. So the robbing screens shouldn't help. Um, but we did see that the robbing screens helped. So this robbing hypothesis doesn't really seem to fit either where these bees are actually picking up mites and bringing them home. Um, because if that were the case, uh, they would not have been slowed down by the robbing screens at all and they wouldn't have helped, um, but they did. So that doesn't really seem to fit either. So we sort of saw a weird combination of these things where varroa loads did increase faster with any bee visitation. So what it seems like is happening is that bees from this low mite colony um, are visiting this high mite colony, right? And they were neighbors in the same apiary and we frequently observed blue bees in these red colonies. And then both blue and red bees are bringing mites picked up from these high mite colonies to these receiver colonies. So it seems like screening might help. It seems like um, anything you can sort of do to prevent this visitation might help. Um, and it seems like any form of visitation in the fall is going to increase your mite load. We think that there are just so many mites present in colonies, it's really hard to get your mite loads low in the fall, um, that it's just really likely that there's a lot of spreading between these these colonies. So really the moral of the story here is that you really need to check your mite loads before and after treatment to make sure your mite load actually went down um, or is at an acceptable level to you because you might have to treat again. Um, we think combining treatments with a non-chemical method like splitting might really be beneficial because you're killing more of the mite population um, that lives under the cappings. We think that a Pre-winter treatment after the bees kind of stop moving around so much might be really helpful. Um, we're big fans of a very late fall, sort of late October, early November oxalic acid treatment. Um, you know, because the bees kind of stop moving at that point, it's a little bit too cold for them to move around, at least for us further up north. Um, so the spreading should sort of have decreased by then. So you really want to make sure you start with a clean bill of health at that point. Um, and really regardless of the mechanism, whether it's robbing, whether it's mite bomb, whether it's a combination, uh, these highly infested colonies in the landscape represent a real threat to colonies nearby. So it's just really important to be very vigilant um, with your monitoring and make sure that you're staying on top of it because um, there really are no guarantees in how well your treatment's gonna work. There's just so many of us in the landscape with so many colonies close to each other. The only way to really know what's happening is to check. So. Um, yeah, try to check as often as you can. Okay, um, and just to conclude, uh, Sentinel apiaries help inform beekeeper management so you can get an idea of what your mite loads look like um, and know when to treat and how much to treat. And they can help you plan for the future. So the more familiar you become with your colony health trends over long periods of time, over a whole season, the more you will be able to predict how those are going to continue in the future and in future years. So you can sort of better prepare for when your mite loads are gonna spike, um, when you're gonna need to put supers on and take them off. Um, the more detailed records you have and the more you put effort into tracking that, um, the better you can sort of plan for the future. And then also, this really provides us with 
incredibly valuable data that can help us answer some of these questions beekeepers bring to us, um, such as all these weird things that are going on with mites. Um, we're just learning new things all the time. So um, this data is incredibly valuable. And to any Sentinel participants that are listening, we sincerely thank you for your participation. Um, we know it's a lot of work to take these samples. So we're glad that you get something out of it and we really appreciate what we're able to get out of it. Okay, so I will thank BIPS um, sponsors and all of our collaborating universities. And I can take any questions that are in the chat. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was wonderful. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are recording this. And so um, if you have to leave at the hour and we're still doing questions, um, there will be a recording available for a little while after this. Um, and if you have more questions, go ahead and start typing them into the chat box and Eric will help moderate that Q&A for us. Just a quick announcement in case we do go over the hour and you need to leave. We are having another uh, webinar in two weeks about brood disease. So um, this will be presented by a panel of our field health specialists that see a lot of colonies throughout the season in commercial operations. So they'll be sharing a lot of good information. So please join us. Um, I actually don't even think I introduced myself at the beginning of this. I'm Nett Meredith, the Executive Director of BIP. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric Malcolm, who's on our staff, who will be helping to moderate the Q&A. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Nett. Awesome job, Kelly. That was fun. That was uh, Thank you. very educational. I mean, every time. <laughs> There's some good stuff there. That, uh, that was really neat. Um, the horizontal transmission study was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, that one was a lot of work, so I'm glad something interesting came out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, so we've got a couple, actually quite a lot of good questions. Um, <clears throat> so I want to go ahead and see how many we can get to. Okay. Um, so the first one, David Hicks uh, mentioned his, that his mentor is setting up his Sentinel Apiary tomorrow. Thank Yay. you. Yay! Awesome. Um, and he was wondering about the hive scale, if that needs to um, be particularly level. If the hive scale needs to be level. Um, so I think it is ideal if it's level, although I think um, a lot of the hive scale, I mean, for the, in terms of like the um, value, valuableness, accuracy of the data. I think a lot of the hive scales are built um, sort of with the understanding your hive scales might not be perfectly level. We have had some issues with the hive scales not being perfectly level and then the higher you stack on top of it, if you end up with a really tall colony, all of a sudden it's listing very far to one side like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So <laughs> it can get a little bit shaky um, in that regard. So I would try to put in a little bit of effort to make it as level as possible, but it does not have to be perfect. So thank you. So we've got a, a Rick Brook commented that he loved the uh, the flattening the curve analogy. I just wanted to pass that on. It was great. Right. Yeah, I know it's actually very convenient timing for my message, although not for anything else. So, but silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, and uh, and so uh, Valley caught. I hope I said that right, Valley. Um, she was wondering what is the lifespan of a varroa mite and how long do they live approximately. Ooh, great question. Um, so I actually don't know that off the top of my head. And I know that there is a lot of varroa biology that we do not know or understand. Um, but I would assume that it probably changes over the season. I think probably pretty similarly to bees, a mite that's going to have to live over winter is going to have to live longer than a summer mite. Um, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. I would guess a couple of weeks. Um, if any of the BIP people know the answer and want to put it in the chat or chime in, um, yeah, feel free. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I don't either. So I'm going to, if, if anybody does and they want to plop that into the, uh, the chat, that'd be awesome. Um, Valley did have another kind of a follow-up question. She said, you don't seem to mention too much of the, uh, the mechanical methods of brood breaks, queen caging, um, drone calling, etc." Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I guess if you're looking on resources about how best to perform those things, um, I know those are available online, um, and that a lot of good universities, um, and extension people have put out, um, fact sheets and stuff on how to do that. I'm sure that we could, um, sort of do a roundup um, of resources for that sort of a thing. Um, but yeah, we definitely do think that 
um, splitting and brood breaks seem to be coming increasingly important and that they work very well when they're combined, especially with a chemical treatment. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to go into depth um, on giving a lesson on doing that at the moment, but um, we, I think we can definitely try to send some resources people's way if they want help with that. And um, thank you. So um, Sue Rowland had a question. She said, would mites cover up the red paint from the high mite colonies? Um, so I think the um, paint dots were probably about the size of four or five mites. So I think even if you had a mite on the thorax, enough of the paint would be visible for the camera to take a photo. Um, it recognizes like a very small number of colored pixels. Um, so I don't think that would be an issue in terms of the camera missing things because the mites were covering it. Um, on a kind of funny side note, we did have mites that were attached to the bees while we were painting them um, on the thorax. So we did actually end up painting a couple mites because they were sort of in the way of the paint marks. So um, yeah, they, they had a bad day, those mites. They get painted <laughs> and then kind of scurry off. Um, but yeah, I don't think they would cover enough of the paint to, so that we would miss the photo in the camera. Nice. So um, Jay Williams asked, he said, from the high mite colony, would bees still be healthy enough to be flying the same amount as low mite bees? Like, um, and he, he mentions like DWV or K-wing issues, et cetera. Yeah, great question. Um, so that's definitely an issue that um, also sort of doesn't make a lot of sense when we think about the mite bomb hypothesis is that um, a lot of those bees might not be healthy enough to, um, fly very well. I think one of the ideas behind the mite bomb hypothesis is this idea um, that parasites want to propagate themselves, right? Um, they want to spread. And viruses want to do that as well. So there are lots of instances in biology and entomology where um, organisms that fall ill with a virus or a parasite, um, as a result of that, as a symptom of the illness, actually are more likely to um, expose themselves to other individuals to further propagate that virus or that illness. So um, I think the idea here was that there might be something about the mites or the viruses that actually makes these bees more likely to seek out a new host for that virus. So um, while a certain population, percentage of the population might not be healthy enough to make the trip to a nearby apiary. The idea is that enough bees might have been able to, to still cause a problem for the neighbors. And actually a very cool paper came out like two days ago that showed that bees that were infected with Israeli acute paralysis virus smell different and behave a little bit differently. And that makes them much more able to get into other colonies. So it does seem like there is something to that idea of the viruses actually affecting the bees in such a way that it makes it easier for them to get into a new colony and to spread that virus. That is fascinating. Cool. So the uh, next question is from Sue Warner. Um, Sue Warner said, um, <clears throat> um, isn't the mite transmission of bees from the receiver colonies going to the donor colonies to rob as, as those high mite colonies are crashing? Yeah, so that's the robbing hypothesis. So that's the idea that um, the strong receiver colonies would rob those weak colonies and pick up mites in the process and bring them home. Um, and it's possible that that happened, but again, the robbing screens helped. So um, it doesn't seem like that explains 100% of the increase in mite load that we saw. And it seems like there is something to visitation from foreign bees um, that, that affects the mite load somehow. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, a, a number of more questions here. I don't know how much time we've got, but um, I will continue to ask these questions until I'm told to stop. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. we schedule this till 11.15, thinking that okay. some of the questions may go over the hour. So I think we'll, it'll cut out at quarter till after. Perfect. Okay, well, let's, let's rock. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jeff asked, he said, the camera photographed a visiting bee in front of the colony. Does that equate the visiting bee actually entering the hive long enough for a mite transfer? Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, although we had photographs of these bees at the colony entrances, we don't know for sure that they made it in. Um, we tried to manually search for these painted bees in the colonies, but that 
is so time consuming that it's, that it doesn't really work very well. Um, so we are making the assumption that those bees made it in. Um, I think that the evidence that the mite loads increased so much in visited colonies shows that um, there, there are a certain number of bees getting in, whether every photograph bee made it in, we don't know. Um, but that's definitely something that I would like to do in another experiment where we actually get to test um, that the bees are actually entering and maybe even find a way to track the mites themselves. Um, because we also don't know that these bees had mites on them, for sure. So um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely still a lot of questions to answer and I would definitely like to do a follow-up study. If we could somehow track the mites themselves, that would be the best way to do it, I think, because that would really be a smoking gun, so to speak. So um, yeah, always more work to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of a Christine Scheel asked a similar well, the question that I, I believe uh, you may have just kind of answered with that, that wrap up there where she asks, can bees from a hive with a robbing screen have the knowledge to rob another hive with a robbing screen? It's yeah, I agree question. Um, so we're not really sure about that either. Um, I think the idea, the entrance on the robbing screen is the same width as a small entrance reducer and the other colonies that were not screened had the big opening on the entrance reducer. So I think even um, if bees from screened colonies were moving amongst each other, it would still be harder for them to get in just because of that smaller entrance. But yeah, I mean, that's another thing we don't know is that um, we don't know how much the receiver colonies were, vi were visiting each other, right? Um, none of those bees were marked. So uh, they could have been, there could have been a lot of visitation between receiver colonies that we missed. Um, so yeah, again, more, more to, more to ask. <laughs> always more to learn for sure. Yeah. Um, so um, Anna or Anna, I'm sorry if I, I say this wrong. Um, Pfeiffer has uh, a, probably one of my favorite questions on here. What do you have to do to become a Sentinel Apiary? <laughs> oh, excellent question. Um, so please register at our website. Um, it's here on the screen, beinformed.org, and you can actually go straight to beinformed.org slash Sentinel. Um, when you just register on there, you can pay by a credit card and we will get your registration and ship you a kit as soon as possible. And it, and it also looks like Rick Brook just signed up as well. So thank you, Rick. Amazing. That's awesome. So yeah, and he actually posted the, the a link there. You can copy and paste for the sign up. Thanks, um, Rick. Yeah, thank you, Rick. That's awesome. Uh, let's see here. So Everett Painter says, um, data looks variable. Will you repeat the study, um, perhaps in another geography? Yeah, so data was variable. Um, the error bars are large, although we did have significance. Um, so. Um, that's good. Yeah, we would like to repeat the study. Um, this was a lot of work for me personally. So these Raspberry Pis were hooked to um, just like regular batteries, um, like a battery that you would use to charge your cell phone. And so I had to change them every single day and the experiment lasted six weeks. Um, so <laughs> The emotional thought of repeating it now is like a little bit daunting, but now that I'm a doctor, I can like hire a master's student or someone else to do it in my stead. So um, yeah, we would like to repeat it and we would like to answer some of these questions that I'm talking about. Um, I think there is a lot more to be learned here. I think the viruses are also at play um, and we, we didn't get to look at that very much. So um, I, yeah, I do think that it could definitely stand to be repeated. Gotcha. So um, guys, there, there are a lot of questions on here. We've got about 10 minutes before we get uh, booted. So um, I am going to get a little bit, um, I may not get to all the questions here, but uh, oh, just, just wondering, because there's a, a person, William uh, Fackrell asked if the tech, technical information is available uh, for that camera setup you have. Ah, uh, okay. Um... No, I have not written down the protocol of how I did that or, or shared the code. I definitely could. Um, but I, I will tell you that I literally just ripped off YouTube videos. I just Googled like, you know, um, Raspberry Pi color detection um, and watched YouTube videos and it, it only took me a few weeks to figure it out. But um, yeah, I do want to make um, work on making that shareable because yeah, there's no reason that it needs to be proprietary or anything. So yeah. Cool. That'll be fun. 
<laughs> okay, so um, Evan Henry asks, what Varroa count method did you use? Are you worried about reliability or repeatability of that method? Um, and he, he mentions that he asks because a paper that he submitted didn't get accepted right away because the sugar roll method was not reliable even though um, he had a few measures within a month period. Wow, um, that's surprising. So, I mean, yeah, people think the sugar roll is not as good as the alcohol wash, but there are tons and tons of papers that use sugar roll. Um, and it's, we think it's reliable enough to let you know, on, especially like at an apiary level, what, what you're working with. So that's surprising. But we used um, alcohol wash. So we did alcohol wash at the beginning and the end. And then all of these colonies also had sticky boards on them. Um, and the sticky boards showed the same trends. I just did not share the sticky board data. But yeah, I changed the sticky boards every three days. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so we've got another question. Um, David uh, Skirsbeck, Skirsbeck, I'm sorry, David, it's David. We're, we can find, um, where can I find more studies debunking the mite bond phenomenon? Ah, okay, um, let's see. Tom Seeley just came out with one called like robbing screens or robbing lures versus bite bombs, I think it's called. Um, I don't know if these are publicly available. That's one of the really stupid things about science is that a lot of the papers you have to pay for access. Um, but we can try to get PDFs of those also if, if people email us um, and share those. But yeah, if you go onto Google Scholar and you search honeybee broa um, horizontal transmission, Frey, F-R-E-Y, also did a lot of work on this. Um, Gloria de Grandy Hoffman has a good paper about it. Um, so yeah, they're, they're mostly papers on, if you just look, search on Google Scholar. Awesome, thank you. So, um, oh, our, our own Jerry, Jerry Parent um, messaging. Hey, Jerry. Uh, she was asking if uh, you could talk about the role that drone layer colonies might play in um, the mite bomb robbing transmission that relationship there yeah um so drone layer colonies i think obviously have a lot higher rates of mite increase because mites love drone brood and they can reproduce better in drone brood um so yeah i mean i would definitely imagine that if you had a drone layer colony that would basically be acting as one of those high mite colonies um and it's a drone layer is kind of hard to rectify um, all of our colonies in the study remained queen right throughout the duration, which was very happy. Um, so, yeah, but I, yeah, I imagine that would be bad news. <laughs> actually, uh, I have one of those right now, and all the all the drones are are actually worker size. Oh, weird. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, I was looking, and I'm like, their eyes are wrong. Uh, but that's that's not uh, that's okay. We'll fix it. <laughs> It's early. You Some can... friend. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so, uh, okay, so Joseph, um, Joseph Lilinho um, mentions he manages the hive and, obs and uh, the observation hive at Liberty Science Center. And he said, we're always looking for ways to attract kids to the observation hive. Would it work to collect bees going out foraging, mark and release to go out and watch when they return and how long it takes? I'm open to suggestions that could work better. Um, yeah, I mean, that would definitely work. Uh, studies have done that where they catch either leaving foragers or returning foragers. Um, I think how long it takes really greatly varies on what's blooming, the weather, how many workers are out, things like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know how quick it would be if it would be within like the average kid's attention span, but maybe if you went in the morning and marked a whole bunch of bees and then you could <laughs> kind of get ahead of it, um, then, then that might work out but th that sounds like a fun idea yeah. and uh, Dusty Raglan um, he or she asks um, is there any research that looked at bee genetics at their resistance to pests yeah um, great question so I'm gonna assume that you mean resistance to like visitation like what I talked about there's definitely I mean all of these um, like Varroa hygienic queen lines um, are more hygienic and they work. Um, you usually still have to combine them with monitoring and treating as needed, but they can reduce the number of treatments that you need to apply. Um, but yeah, now there's sort of thought about if visitation is an issue, um, 
using a more defensive stock that's better at um, guarding and defending might be beneficial to sort of keep some of these visiting bees out. Um, of course, we don't really like to use defensive stock because it's a lot more fun to keep bees that are gentle and nice and not defensive. Um, but yeah, I guess that's something to consider and something we might look into in the future as well. And, uh, and Lisa uh, Skogland, hey Lisa, how are you? Um, she asks, there are more studies concerning the hive placement within the yard that deals with drift. Do you take that idea into consideration? Yeah, um, so yeah, there are a lot of studies um, looking at hive placement and arrangement and paint colors and putting different markings and things to try to reduce drift within an apiary. Um, so we weren't really considering that for this study because we were trying to look at drift or visitation between apiaries. Um, so, and I, I think that a lot of this visitation was intentional um, and was sort of a robbing type behavior. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's an issue of the bees really getting confused in this case and accidentally drifting to the wrong colony. Um, I think it's um, a more intentional visitation. But um, again, yeah, reducing drifting within your apiary can definitely be beneficial if you're trying to um, reduce the spread of mites within your own apiary. All the time we see, you know, one colony sort of spikes with mites earlier than the rest. Um, and then the next month, everybody else has high mites. And it's probably a combination of drift and just other factors like mite reproduction and things like that. But um, it definitely probably doesn't hurt to reduce drift. Thank you. And um, last, it looks like uh, Christine Scheel had another question. She said, it looks like you're using the nurse bees to check for Nozema as well. Would you get a better result if you used older bees? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think there is concern about the foragers being more exposed to Nozema. Um, so, Nocema is a little bit tricky, I think, in general. Um, it's usually sort of like a secondary symptom, like your Nocema infection only usually gets really bad if something else is wrong with your hive. Um, so our concern, I think, more in the forefront is with getting an accurate mite count. So if the accuracy of the Nocema count fluctuates a little bit because of that, I think, you know, our priority is the mites. That's what people are more concerned about. That's usually the bigger issue and the thing that you can actually successfully treat for. Um, so that's why we went with the nurse bees. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's possible that we might have different numbers if, for Nocema if we use forage bears. Gotcha. So um, that, that's all the questions, I think, and all the questions we have time for. Great. I think, I think uh, you, you, everybody sees Kelly's email down here and you can also contact us on our website if you have other questions that you want to ask and uh, we'll do our best to get back to you. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. That was a great set of questions. We appreciate the um, interactive uh, chat feature there. Um, join us in a couple weeks um, and we'll, we'll be sharing information um, on brood diseases. And a round of applause. We know we can't hear you, but Kelly can see some of your videos for, <laughs> you know, great loud applause for her presentation. Thank Thanks you all. Well. And enjoy, enjoy your weekends. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.